Cheers, guys. Epics 911. Welcome to the Wednesday, January 11th, 2017 edition of VR News. Lots to talk about, guys. Let's jump right into VR and start with this story out of the UK. Involves Sony and a UK merchandise company called Numskull. Now, together, they partnered to release an official headset stand for the PlayStation VR HMD. Only, nobody heard of it. There was pretty much no marketing, no fanfare. It was released just before Christmas. Sold out like hotcakes all over the UK. And then gets talked about. <laughs> so, take a look at this thing. It's obsidian, beautiful black with a nicely finished chrome base plate for about half the price of competing types of this product. Now, these guys are selling for 29 pounds, which works out to about $36 US only. You can't get this in the US or Canada or anywhere else right now, except the UK via game stores, Amazon UK, or the web wing for Numskull Yellow Bulldog. So it is available via that. Don't believe it's allowing for shipments overseas. So again, if you're on this side of the pond, I think you're out of luck. But uh, it's definitely getting to that price point where it's starting to look pretty attractive. Now, probably still a little too rich for my blood, especially having three HMDs. That still gets pretty costly. We've had that discussion when I last talked about a product like this. Some of you mentioned, look, you can get a piece of wood and styrofoam head, paint it black, and there you are. Yeah, it's not going to look as good, but I get your point. Um, and again, it's just a little too rich for my blood at this point. But if the aesthetics of that are super important, uh, yeah, it's going to be a good investment. For me, I got nice space on a bookshelf. When they're done serving as props, on the shelf they go. Everyone's happy, including my wallet. <laughs> Now, next story, Zimmers offering mobile VR tracking starting at $99. Now, these guys at CES were able to show their technology to one of the riders at Upload VR, and they've got two solutions that they're working on. They're working on an outside in tracking and an inside out tracking. He got to try both. The outside in tracking is designed for Gear VR type headsets, specifically this test for the Gear VR, which we know has no positional tracking. So what their product does is it provides positional tracking for those mobile solutions, outside in variety. So what it does is it has a camera that scans 120 degree field of view, three by three meters, so roughly nine by nine feet, and it does, within that space, it tracks three LED lights. Now, at first glance, they look a lot like the PlayStation motion controllers. In fact, they definitely, at least, at the very least, look like they were inspired by them. You look closer, you see differences. But at a glance, that's what they look like. Each of those has a circular light, just like the motion controller. The third light is right on the forehead of the HMD. So it uses those three light points to provide the tracking information. And it worked fairly well, he said, although he would have liked to have done more testing, you know, in a bit more controlled environment. Because even though it was a Saturday, it was a little slower at the CES, it was still pretty hectic. Now, the next system, the inside out one, was very similar, except instead of having the third light on the forehead of the HMD, that light was replaced with a camera. So it was able to do the tracking that way. The representative there pointed out that the Zimmers sensor was only tracking the lights, which makes sense. That's what it's designed to do. And it doesn't know that that's a camera because it's looking for a light. It has no way. So what they said was the Qualcomm reference headset that he was using it was providing that additional tracking. So they're still working on that technology. They're probably a few months away from being able to market that or bring it to market. 
but the other one, the outside in tracking solution with the three lights should be ready for March for $99 US. So definitely something to tinker with. Um, because it's not a one-to-one -one thing, and I've talked about that with the touch controllers and other products, meaning one of those isn't sold for every Gear VR out there because there's now millions of Gear VRs. There's not a lot of incentive for developers to you know, include that functionality because not many people can use it. So one way devs get around that or the manufacturers of these products is they pay the companies to put that functionality in. But very much like the new 3DS model with that new faster processor, which only has Xenogears, I think, to show for it, a lot of developers don't then follow the procession and start including that, right? Short of having to pay them too. So I love it, but I would rather see a device from the outset start sales, maybe the next version of Gear VR with that functionality bundled in. Third party like this, I don't know how successful it'll be and how it's going to ultimately get used. Next news story, Dell's VR future includes a premium head-mounted display for VR and it'll probably be wireless. This according to Liam Quinn. He's the chief technology officer and a vice president at Dell. He was interviewed by Jamie Feltham from Upload VR. We've had lots of his stories on this news program. And he was asked basically a bunch of questions. And this is how Liam answered. So in terms of the tracking system, he felt was going to be, you know, the more popular. He felt the future was in inside out tracking. Now, most of us want that, but I still think there's an argument for outside in. Right now, it's the most accurate, and it doesn't require redesigning a lot of stuff. Like, look at the stuff that's coming out for just the Vive Lighthouse tracking system. Because it's open and because, you know, it's available in big numbers at good ratios, it's appealing for people to use that. So, the, you know, going with uh, the inside-out tracking, I do agree. There's going to be a lot of people using that, and it may yet win out as the most popular one to look forward to, but I think it's a slower road getting there than the next year, for example. He also said absolutely when asked about Dell having their own head-mounted display and indicated that wireless capability was probably going to be part of that headset's capabilities. So very cool. Be interesting to see what Dell comes up with. We saw some of those other units, the Acer ones, and you know, some strange color choices and aesthetics, but all in all, they look good. Even if half of them looked like Sony clones, they all looked comfortable at least. Next up, we have the Freedom Locomotion System. Now, this is a comprehensive package for VR movement from a company called Huge Robot. What they've done to create this freedom locomotion system is taken a bunch of locomotion concepts that are being used right now every day in different virtual reality games and either refining them, altering them somewhat, uh, or making them work with other forms of locomotion. So all these different ones kind of under the same umbrella and I think it looks amazing. For example, they have a version of raw data's dash system, which, or raw data calls it something else. They call it dash. They've also got uh, a blink style system. So the teleport, except you got to see the video for how they pull it off. It looks way more immersive. You don't have that disorientation of literally having the screen disappear. Everything stays rock solid. It's just, imp it just impacts your movement, which I think is going to do a lot for motion sickness like benefit it, meaning it might cut down on the incidence of motion sickness. They've also got what they're calling their coat system, which is carry accessory uh, on the spot. So you're basically running in place. And yeah, it's kind of dorky to do, and it looks dorky, but super effective. For me, for example, I used it heavily playing Doom 3, the Vive version. It's got that smooth locomotion. I never got motion sick with it, 
but it felt more natural to me, like I was really walking around when I was walking in place. And that's what I did. It just added a lot to it. So I think they're on the right track with that system. What I really like is a gesture-based turning. So a combination of a hand gesture, so it's part tracking and I think part controller command, it was just like a little subtle flick of the wrist. He was able to pivot 45, 90 degrees in game while facing the same direction in real life, which I thought was really cool because that allows you to do 360 degree style content 180, always facing the camera, for example, or whatever you happen to be doing. But um, the director for Huge Robot, his name is George Kong. He's got an awesome 15 minute video. All the stuff I've talked about and more, he goes into detail, but he doesn't do it uh, in a way that's hard to follow. And I love what he says uh, about you know, the challenges of VR locomotion and how they plan as a company to overcome them. So check that out, link in the description below. Next up, Envelop VR has closed their doors. And if like me, you said who? <laughs> Which is unfortunate. I mean, it's horrible anytime a VR company closes, but we've said from day one, we knew there were gonna be casualties. That's a given. And to be honest, I heard of these guys once when I talked about them. There were no follow-ups, nothing, just silence. And then this announcement is literally the second time I hear the name mentioned. Unlike software that they were kind of competing with, virtual desktop, big screen, which I heard about almost on a weekly basis, would log into to see features, test them out that were announced, etc. It doesn't surprise me, let's put it that way. Now they burn through millions, at least four or five million dollars in investment money. Granted, payroll goes very quick. You have a dozen engineers, for example, or say half a dozen plus some programmers, you can go through a million bucks salary per year uh, easily. So that's a million dollars of your investment money just for a year. Also, probably very clear, they had no revenue model. They had no way to be self-sufficient with this. It was pretty much probably all being pumped into R&D with at the end of the day, nothing to show for it, nothing coming back, no positive cash flow out of this. So yes, it's unfortunate, but that's reality. Next news story, Sennheiser has a $1,700 microphone and it is called the Ambio VR microphone. It's their first foray into 3D audio and weighs about 400 grams. It has four cardioids inside. In fact, when I saw it out of the corner of my eye, the picture, the first picture I saw, it looked gold. And I'll explain. And my next thought was, okay, that's why it's 1700. It's some kind of jewelry microphone thingy. No, that never gets seen. It was gold underneath. Once you take the microphone sheath off, the cardioids themselves, the four that make that up, where you talk into, they were gold colored, right? So the Blue Yeti, I believe, has three cardioids. This unit has four, the Sennheiser. It does omnidirectional, stereo, etc. You can use it for podcasts, group chats. And like I said, it provides 3D audio. You get it as a kit with the microphone a set of balanced XLR cables, Rycote suspension mount, foam windshield, and access to the company's proprietary A-B format encoder. So all of that for the $1,700. Little rich for my blood as well, but you know they're known for quality and I'll agree. Like when I had my Sennheiser wired headphones, I've used them the last six years. They sounded good and it wasn't until I got these the G933's Artemis Logitech ones that are wireless that I retired the Sennheiser set. But I got to admit, my first thought was, why didn't I do this two years ago, right? Because I'm really enjoying the wireless. Just being able to get up is awesome. In fact, the first few times I had that paranoia, crap, cord, and then realized, yeah, there's no cord, right? Next news story, Jules Erbach of Otoy. 
uh, highlights Unity plugin capability with their Octane renderer. We talked about this a few months ago. It was awesome then, it's still awesome. Their render software is able to take real life footage, pictures, and convert that very quickly and efficiently into a 3D VR capable environment. And the way it does that is just super impressive. Now, like the George Kong video, Jules also has a video where he explains a lot of this. And, and as with George, he does it in fairly layman's terms. I mean, there's some stuff on their industry stuff that I had no idea, like the scene baking. Baking to me is pastries. So I had no idea what the hell he was talking about till I watched it and I realized it was more of a rendering type thing. Now, as far as the abilities, what their claim is, is the turnaround time for development. So to do what they can do would normally take days, weeks of rendering. With theirs, you can do a lot of that on the fly at a much higher quality with a lot of engine effects thrown in. In fact, they have one feature called path tracing, which is an extension of ray tracing. Now, ray tracing is kind of how the 3D market really started getting popular. There were 3D games in the 80s, Driller and some other ones, early 90s, Ultima Underworld. But it wasn't until Wolfenstein and Doom, which were 2.5D, not really true 3D, but they kind of had that ray, ray tracing going on. And now it's almost come full circle because with this, they're able to more efficiently compared to rasterization, like most 3D engines use, they're able to use simulated light paths to build up that information. And the end result is stunning. And this can produce effects like diffuse color bleeding, glossy reflections, soft shadows, etc. Take a look at the video, looks bloody amazing. All right, guys, that's it for the news tonight. Little late, my apologies. Hope you guys are having a kick-ass week. Cheers as always, and definitely catch you guys on the VR flip side.